竜を操ることのできる青年がお姫様のために戦いそのお姫様と一緒になることを約束して国を守ったのところが王族の人たちが竜を操る青年のことを恐れるようになってしまいお姫様には内緒で毒殺してしまったというの薬を飲ませて殺してしまったのひどい何も知らないお姫様は竜の服装火を棺に入れると後を追うように自殺してしまったのよ本当に愛してる人が死んだら私も後を追うかもしれない It would be an understatement to say SSS Gridman and SSS Dinazanon draw quite a bit from the original Hyper Agent Gridman. In placing audio from the original with visuals from the series heavily drawing from that very same tale, I hope to at least offer a taste of my experiences. While much of the YouTube discussion on SSS's Gridman goes back to its original airing over two years ago, I was a bit late to the party. But, compared to what I found from Anime YouTube, I was able to come in with a different perspective. As not one person I saw claimed to watching all of the original Gridman in full before or after watching SSSS. So, it stands to reason that I would love to point out what I noticed that I've yet to see discussed. And certainly, it's within expectations for me to use anime as a way to raise interest in tokusatsu. Like that video I did. I also just think that points like those I'll make later are going to make more sense to those who've seen the shows I'm talking about. However, that's about where we come to the Gridman problem. While the experience of watching Dinazanon and especially SSSS Gridman might be enhanced by having context from the original, the original Gridman is kinda not great. Personally speaking, having now seen 32 complete seasons of various tokusatsu works, even after gaining further appreciation for Gridman retroactively through SSSS, it's not my least favorite toku, but it's comfortably around the bottom. And that only makes it harder to push my agenda of, hey, Toku is good and really important, so you should maybe be more aware of it and even try watching it. I do think there is plenty of merit to the series regardless of my personal feelings, so don't let me thinking it's kind of eh deter you, especially if you already like SSS Gridman, Dinazanon, and wouldn't mind getting even more out of them. But at the same time, enjoying one doesn't necessarily mean you'll enjoy the others. And the feelings of fans who like the original but don't care for SSSS are just as valid even if I feel differently. While all of them have episodic kaiju battles, SSSS Gridman is primarily interested in its character study of Akane and the overall mystery as the nature of the world and its controlling forces are gradually revealed. Dinazanon leans more into its larger cast and their interactions and dynamic as they work through their regrets and grief. Both of these are huge tonal, genre, and structural departures from the original Hyper Agent Gridman, much more in line with its Ultraman roots as a Tsuburaya production, rather than aliens. Gridman's sci fi angle focuses on technology gone wrong, each episode having some aspect of the world we live in twisted by the Monster of the Week ruining it from the digital innards. Coming from the early 90s certainly risks dating it, but lots of what was silly and absurd then is going to be silly and absurd now. And trust me, some of these episodes are wild. Wait until you watch the resident Big Bad bring back the samurai Benke from the past to protect his human pawn, only for him to get bored and go to McDonald's. Hell, in some ways it might have aged well. At the very least, the idea of a self driving smart car being commandeered and going on a joyride is somewhat more feasible now than it was in 1993. However, while its silly absurdity can offer plenty of enjoyment, the cast is purposefully simple to facilitate the variety of scenarios and sci fi focus, which definitely won't be everyone's cup of tea. Plus, there's no good set of subtitles, and likely won't be until Mail Creek's upcoming release of the show. If you really are interested in the original, I'd recommend at least trying to watch it in full. But a part of my dilemma is also a matter of respect. You don't have all the time in the world. Most people watching the video probably aren't even going to bother starting Gridman, let alone actually finishing it. But while I will be giving an episode guide for the original Gridman, as a creator who holds myself to a certain standard, I want to be transparent. As I intend to come from an informed position, For me, finishing the thing I plan to discuss on this channel, or at least getting caught up with it, is basic to me. I watched all of Gridman, and SSSS, and Dinazanon, so when it comes to my later readings of any of them, you can trust that I did my basic due diligence in viewing all the media I discussed. I want to come from an informed position as to better ensure my audience doesn't walk away from the video as ignorant as I might have been otherwise. With other creators, 
I hope that they would respect the time I spend on their videos to at least be transparent about how much they watched of whatever it is they discussed so I can know where they're coming from, since an incomplete viewing risks incomplete readings. Especially considering the turnover time of seasonal content discussion, I understand not going back to the original even if it means coming from a more informed position. I'm not saying everyone has to go back and watch the original to talk about SSSS, that's absurd. The director of both anime, Amamiya Akira, has even gone on record stating that both shows are made so that even watching one of them without context from the others would still allow the viewer to understand it. Having readings from that perspective is perfectly valid, and some of those videos were helpful or interesting to me. In particular, Replay Value's look at the motifs and parallels in episode 9, and Nearly on Red's casual analysis of the final episode. But from where I stand, my perspective is not one strongly represented on YouTube. To that end, I also recommend checking out Mock Dent's SSSS Gridman Reference Guide. While incomplete, it's still majorly in-depth with a lot of interesting details picked up on and even how those references work to enhance the series. While one way to read into works is the purest approach, many of the SSSS Gridman videos taking this route, and is one that has value in being represented, especially with so many Western viewers having the anime as their first and only exposure to Gridman, that's not really the space it inhabits. We live in a multimedia environment where, even if English availability is often limited, supplemental works are exceedingly common, so it wouldn't be right to entirely reject them as a community. Thus, my approach. One that will incorporate the drama CDs, Trigger's Boys Event Great Hero short anime, the opening theme's official music video, and of course, the original series Hyper Agent Gridman alongside SSSS Gridman. Nothing against Dinozenon, I just don't have that much to say about it in regards to the original Gridman. But, while my video may be incorporating those, in recommending only some of the original Gridman out of respect for your time, in turn, out of respect to the original Gridman, I want to state that this episode guide is not meant to replace the viewing experience of the original Gridman, especially considering that the anime series serve as such a clear love letter to Hyper Agent. Being so reductive of Gridman to claim one can get the full 39 episode experience in any small amount of episodes in turn disrespects what the staff behind the modern series clearly value. I do care about series being initially watched in a way that respects them, even regarding its formula. To say you can watch half the show and claim you've basically watched all of Gridman, in truth, isn't actually representative of the experience of really watching all of it. Yeah, I don't expect a lot of my audience to like the whole thing or even bother, but in picking episodes to recommend, I let some of the ones I thought were interesting, fun, or otherwise of note, even for references, be deliberately cut from the list. Rather than aim to abridge Gridman, I want the guide to be a supplement to SSSS Gridman and Dinozenon, for viewers who want to get more out of those shows without having to watch all 39 episodes of the original. This list isn't the best way to watch Gridman, it's a way to hopefully get more out of the anime sequels. As such, my list is shorter than 15 episodes. Reasoning that if you were to watch these episodes of Hyper Agent, and the 24 episodes of SSS Gridman and Dinezanon, you'd end up spending about as much time on all of them as you would if you only watched the original Gridman. So, without further ado, episodes 1 and 2 introduce the major cast, setting, and overall conflict between the Gridman Alliance and Khan Digifer, who's using Takashi's bitterness and anger at the world, in tandem with his creativity, to make kaiju out of those negative emotions to challenge Gridman. Episode 6 is major in how certain elements recur in the anime, particularly the virtual beings and plenty of imagery. Episode 18 is one of the most important references. With past regrets brought to the present, along with the introduction of Dina Dragon, SSSS Dinazanon is this episode, and the earlier audio is ripped straight from it for a reason. If you only watch two episodes of Hyper Agent Gridman for the purpose of the anime, make this one of them. Episode 20 leans into the creativity angle of the series. Where Takashi designs kaiju to be brought to life, the Gridman Alliance has their own designs and creations they bring to the table for Gridman's sake, this episode using that theme for its conflict. Episode 21, while overall very silly, very much beds itself in dreams, which should flag as familiar if you've seen, or when you watch, SSSS Gridman. Episodes 13 and the 25 and 26 two-parter introduce Gridman's combinations with God Zenon and Dina Dragon, and if 18 is the Dina Zenon episode, then episode 33 is SSSS Gridman, and the standout best episode of the original Gridman by everyone I know at least. Some of the imagery of this episode is so significant to SSSS Gridman that you cannot miss it. And lastly, the 3839 finale two-parter caps off Takashi's character arc and the show as a whole. Of course, I'm not going to get crazy with the episode guide, but I'll add that given Ultraman's huge cultural significance, having some familiarity with it is helpful, 
as the relationship between Gridman and Yuta is more like that of certain older series leads than it is Gridman and Naoto, just as one of many examples. Another major one being a reference to one of the most iconic Ultra moments of all time. So, moving on, we'll be getting into spoiler territory for Hyper Agent and SSSS Gridman, where, by bringing Hyper Agent into the picture, we can use its ideas and conflicts as a lens to view SSSS Gridman, and in turn use that sequel as a lens back to the original, in hopes of a reading that enhances both of them. To begin with the original Gridman, the most important element that factors into SSSS is one that rests in its sci-fi exploration, that of connection. In each episode, Takashi's kaiju makes the technology of the world run rampant, but what drives his emotions is envy. Takashi is surrounded by technology and influenced by it daily, yet unlike him, those around him are able to connect with others. Takashi only receives his mother's orders over the phone, while others can enhance meaningful relationships with friends or family even over long distances. Music can bring people together through its beautiful sound, but Takashi, having no one, would rather see it twisted to discordant noise out of spite. Having no connections, he finds pleasure in targeting the happiness of others, but time and time again, he fails. While the world uses technology so heavily, being inconvenienced or threatened by Takashi's schemes, it's Naoto's courage and desire to protect his community, friends, and family that allowed him to bond with Gridman and fight. So many of those Takashi comes to threaten are people who've met or otherwise known Naoto, Yuka, and Ipe, who were so quickly able to connect while Takashi remains alone and bitter. Takashi's character arc reaches a critical point in episode 33, where his desires are placed right in front of him. Appearing much like himself, Takeo comes into the picture and achieves all that he ever wanted by instantly making friends with Naoto's group, including Yuka, whom Takashi has an unrequited desire for. Bold, heroic, and affable, by accomplishing what Takashi couldn't despite his rigid upbringing as an elite, Takashi's emotions lead to him enacting his scheme, using the technology people wear to control their bodies, causing plenty of havoc only to once again be stopped by Gridman. In the wake of the failure of yet another of his kaiju, Takashi takes matters into his own hands, plotting to kill Takeo himself, but he's not able to. Facing down Takashi's box cutter, Takeo smiled, unable to hate him, because he was ideal. Perfection lacking even one negative aspect, because he wasn't even real. The product of Takashi's own hopes and imaginations brought to life, the narration explains that Takeo is Takashi's imagined ideal the version of himself he once dreamed about becoming as a child, and one so distant from the boy he currently was. By placing these two versions of Takashi as possibilities, juxtaposed with the younger Takashi at a specific point in his life, the episode comes together. Takashi wasn't always alone. His caretaker once paid attention to him, played with him, helped him enjoy the time he spent with others before he was ripped away from her by his parents. They allowed him no control over his own life, so, lacking that control, he spent the episode, and in some ways, much of the show, finding ways to take control over others, hampering their lives. Having that one connection taken from him, he would come to fail to make any more as he grew up controlled by his parents, trying to twist him into their ideal. Without heavy supervision, he instead retreated into his own devices, his studies and creative exploration, all while burdened with the negative feelings at the rest of the world that was so bright and free compared to him. Faced with what he once hoped to become, Takashi couldn't kill that self. Despite how far gone he was, he still had some goodness in him, as he could not snuff out his childish aspirations. Being left with a mirror into the failure to live up to his past self he now was, all he could do was break down as things returned to normal. And in the final episodes of the show, Takashi finally comes to an impasse with Khan Digifer. In the absence of his parents, Digifer functionally becomes that figure for Takashi. Where his parents neglected him for their own ends, Digifer became his only connection, exploiting his feelings of anger at the world to defeat his longtime enemy Gridman. After a foolproof scheme that not even Gridman could respond to, Takashi goes to Yuka, offering something that will help with the pollution he allowed to spread. And when Ipe seeks to understand his actions and comment on them, given that Takashi is only looking out for Yuka rather than the others, Takashi balks at the idea that anyone could understand him, especially such a normal person. Taken by his own anger, he made the kaiju go wild, and finally, Khan Digifer rejected him. While his parents cared little for him, Digifer had accepted Takashi's true nature, allowing him that outlet to his pain and frustration. 
But Digifur was not human, and Takashi was merely a pawn. Those actions were driven by his human emotions, weaponized against the rest of humanity, where even his enemy had tried to understand Takashi, Digifur didn't care to at all. All he needed to understand humanity was their technology so that he might use it to bring them to ruin. Once Takashi was useless to him, he took control of the systems he'd been manipulating the entire show all at once. And when driven to nothing, when finally needing help, Naoto and his friends came to understand that he was the one who'd caused them so much trouble, and that understanding went both ways as Takashi was made aware of how much they'd been fighting to stop him. The face of his opponent was not Gridman, a being as distant from humanity as Khan Digifur, but the same group of humans he'd, on some level, been longing to join. Finally becoming a part of the Gridman Alliance, he fought in a way only he could, Takashi using his knowledge to destroy all the information on his computer that Digifur was utilizing. By surpassing his need for Khan Digifur, the one who came to understand humanity through Takashi, and was limited by that twisted, hateful understanding, he was able to surpass his past self, showing a lack of reliance on the technology he so often targeted and instead putting his faith in Naoto and Gridman forming a web of connections with the Gridman Alliance that could surpass Khan Digifur. Takashi was no longer alone, and Gridman came to understand that having comrades was truly the strongest power. It's there where Takashi's story ends, and in SSSS Gridman where many of the same ideas recur through Akane, a clear spiritual successor to Takashi. Based on the final scene of the show, in which Akane wakes up from her dream in the real world, earlier information becomes recontextualized. The drama CDs drive home the association. During the dream, CD 9.9 repeating has Yuta recalling when he fell in love with Akane, the girl having a peculiar reaction when Yuta remembers her having long black hair. Then, in drama CD 12.12, taking place after the events of the series, Rika and Sho encounter a girl who looks like Akane did, but has no memory of them. They soon realize that Akane only took on that appearance in the virtual world. With that in mind, how this world was crafted ends up saying much about Akane through implication or otherwise. That she lives in a large house yet stays stuck in one room with no shown family to speak of gives the image that she wants to live alone and manage everything she can by herself, with Alexis serving as the tool that allows her to bend the world into the image she desires as its god. Surrounded by friends, she was no longer alone. With Sho, she had someone to indulge in her nerdy interests with. Through Yuta, she had someone meant to love her. And with Rika, who looks so much like Akane's real self, she had someone to reach out to and save like she herself wanted to be saved. And this aspect is driven home in the ending theme. Given how differently the backgrounds are drawn, one can read this ending as not taking place in the virtual world between Rika and Akane, but in the real world, with Akane and her imagined ideal, the figurative Takeo to Akane's Takashi. One shot of the ending even has Akane with classmates, but they're imposing on her, pressing on her, Akane not smiling like they are, implying dissonance between those she engages with. To that point, in her virtual world, every time her space is imposed on, her world made unideal, she rejects it and remakes it through kaiju evoking those negative emotions. But in the real world, she couldn't do that. So she imagined a version of herself that she wanted to save her, that she wanted to be like. Made to evoke that self that Akane presented to the world, Rika had no particular love of kaiju while Akane's love ran deep. To fit in, Akane buried that otaku side of herself, only showing it to show in the virtual. The last part of the ending has the imaginary self vanishing as Akane is brought back to reality, but ultimately desiring the fantasy, setting the stage for the story to come. Akane's attempts to control the world ultimately begin to unravel through the efforts of the Gridman Alliance. Having designed them, though they were made for a specific purpose, that these three came together was all too fitting, as they each represented a part of herself that she threw away. Rika's home, the second-hand store where the computer junk that brings Gridman to life was left, even calls attention to that which was thrown away. Rika was Akane herself, the version of her she felt she had to present to the world as much as she hated it. Sho was her love of toku that she kept buried and hidden for fear of being unable to connect for it even hidden by her supposed ideal self outside of him, and Yuta, though made to love Akane, only did so secondhand, not loving the ideal self she was presented as, but the original self she'd rejected. Through loving Rika, by extension, Yuta served as Akane's ability to love herself, all three of them being cast away. But though they were leftovers, 
Through that anomaly in Akane's world that was Yuta, someone going against the purpose made for him in loving Rika, Gridman was able to enter this world. Those discarded parts of Akane, that which she rejected, came to find exactly what she wanted. They came to work together, finding friendship and connection, a harmony she'd been unable to come to as she denied herself everything that they were, everything she was. Continuing to fail, losing the control she sought as the Gridman Alliance fought for their everyday lives, the one who allowed her to make this world turned on her. But though she'd spent so much effort cutting away those she'd failed to make a genuine connection with, they did love their creator even where she couldn't. As aspects of herself, in making connections with that which was not ideal about Akane, while Alexis had rejected her for her failures, containing her to continue to make use of her emotions, the Gridman Alliance never stopped reaching out to her, even after she'd hurt them so. As parts of her, by showing their courage and continuing to reach out, by displaying their capabilities, they in turn showed what Akane could be capable of if she had the connections she only needed the courage to make. After being saved, Akane no longer needed the virtual world, though she did leave it with a gift from Rika. One that would serve as a reminder that if she could make friends through all the hardship of kaiju and inhuman beings, then she might be able to make friends anywhere as long as she could make that connection. And in the epilogue, the aftermath is shown in the official music video for Union, where even the title refers to connections. Opening with the ending scene of SSS as Gridman, Akane awakens in the real world rather than the virtual one, going outside and, in referencing symbols from the series, the train crossing, used as a symbol of stagnancy when closed and progress as the gate opens, is followed up here when Akane finally crosses, finding the courage to move across the barrier where she meets her friends from school, making connections in the real world at last. With both of their arcs summarized, I wish to return to Akane and Takashi through Rika and Takeo. The idea of idealized images of the self somehow brought to the world is very much meant to be a reflection, but in some ways, it's an inversion. To go a bit further, I want to bring up Boys Invent Great Hero, a short anime made by Trigger several years before SSSS in tribute to the original Gridman, down to replicating some of the effects work in 2D animation. Based on one of the never-made sequel pitches to the original show, Hyper Agent Gridman Sigma, we see Takashi becoming Gridman Sigma to battle a new threat. What I find is interesting in particular here, however, is the color. Rather than his normal black suit, the older Takashi wears a lighter color, one I see reminiscent of both Takeo's coat and Rika's, or alternatively, the real Akane's. In the context of the original Gridman, this color difference is meant to highlight the difference between Takashi, the bitter loner, and Takeo, his ideal capable of being a good person and making friends. By having Takashi don this color specifically in Boys Invent Great Hero, it highlights his redemption, how, through finally making connections, he was able to change as a person and further surpass his past self, capable of fighting as a hero and taking on a similar mantle that Naoto once bore against threats like the ones he once helped to create. But by placing that color on Rika, rather than Akane's ideal self, it instead points at Akane's flawed perception, something similarly highlighted by the cracked glasses she often wears. Though she took on an idealized image, it's not truly ideal. She only wanted to believe it was. As Rika was able to overcome her problems, she, by being an echo of the real self Akane rejects, is just as capable of being the ideal she wants even though she had struggled for so long to see it in herself. While Takashi and Akane are, for me, the standout parts of both Gridman series, not talking too much about Gridman himself I think would be somewhat disingenuous. After all, I do think there's something of a question to be answered. Why Gridman? As beloved as many tokusatsu heroes are, from Kamen Rider to Ultraman to the plethora of Super Sentai teams, between its ill-fated sequels and the much shorter length of time, there are a handful of reasons Gridman specifically could have touched the hearts of those who enjoyed the show over 25 years ago and came to revisit it in the form of SSSS Gridman, drawing on those sequel ideas that might have fueled imaginations but never came into fruition. But there is one specifically that sticks out to me, in how Gridman separates himself from his contemporaries. While the status quo is in itself a status quo for so many episodic superhero stories, with Gridman so embedded in daily life, the threats to the world not outright from extraterrestrial forces or evil superorganizations, but instead from negative human emotions and the technology we live with day to day. The normal, the status quo, is something the characters have to fight for to maintain their daily life, and at the end of every conflict, 
things go back to normal. The virtual world is repaired, fixing technology in the real world as daily life is restored. While so many of the happenings are still fantastic or even absurd, the ideal of the series is still the peaceful and normal, its perspective characters average and typical. But in Takashi, we have a lonely boy who in part escapes into kaiju, into creativity and fiction. And while he's framed as a villain for so much of the show, he is ultimately understood, and more importantly, saved. Gridman isn't a hero defined by beating monsters or even just protecting people, in that the end of every conflict comes not simply from his victory, but from his fixer beam that repairs the damage that was done. Just because one is breaking connections, even their own, doesn't mean they don't want them. Defeating their negative emotions in the form of kaiju is only the first step. The special signature to save a soul is the fixer beam that saved both Takashi's and Akane's ability to connect to the world around them, one directly and one indirectly. And that is Gridman, new and old. And without having done so, neither Khan, Digifer, or Alexis would have been defeated, the former using Takashi's tech, and the latter feeding on Akane for his immortality. In not just using references, but using them so meaningfully, SSSS Gridman pays an astonishing amount of respect for the original. From something as simple as songs or imagery being drawn upon, the finale of SSS Gridman in turn found a way to connect the audience to Akane through the tokusatsu they love, and I can't deny that I got enjoyment and excitement out of those references. And in doing so, it took elements I'd already gotten something out of, and things which I hadn't paid much attention to at all, and helped me see even more value in them. What more can I ask from such a love letter than something more to love? Once again, I would like to thank my patrons, Bayonort, Brian Neseth, Doja32161, Florbu, Kurosawa, Muhammad Akim, Bro Rike, Justice Man, Sam Belmire, Ten Goon, Offline But Not. And thank you for watching.